If you were stood on this spot on Thursday the 29th of May, 1645, what a sight you'd have seen. All across this ridge, where De Montfort Hall and the University of Leicester now stand, were thousands of royalist soldiers, officers and their horses, all under the leadership of Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Peering through the smoke of the smouldering windmills they had recently burned to the ground, the gathering soldiers could observe the whole of the town of Leicester, its suburbs and surrounding villages. To the north and east, they could see the final elements of the Royalist army arriving from Loughborough, including Lord Astley's division headed towards Woodgate and Colonel Bard's division crossing the river at Belgrave and following the old Roman road towards the town. Directly behind me, just beyond where the Royal Infirmary now stands, Colonel Lyle was positioning two batteries of cannon aimed directly at the town and from there, through the raw dikes and further south towards Aylston, were spread the rest of the Royalist forces. Making himself comfortable at Aylston Hall was God's anointed King of England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales, King Charles I. Looking across to Leicester itself, you could see a flurry of activity as the predominantly civilian defenders of the town frantically sought to shore up the woefully inadequate defences and make final preparations for the inevitable attack by a force that outnumbered them five to one. But the Siege of Leicester was just the culmination of a series of battles and skirmishes between royalists and parliamentary forces across the town and county since the summer of 1642. The English Civil War divided communities, it divided families. And so, to truly understand the 1645 Siege of Leicester, we must first understand the events that led up to it. Welcome to Hidden Histories of Leicester. I'm Jim Butler, and this is An Uncivil War, Part 1. The English Civil War between 1642 and 1651 was in actual fact three wars that spanned the whole period. It is one of the bloodiest chapters in our nation's history, literally pitting brother against brother and father against son. At no point in our country's history, either before or since, have the English people been so divided. If you thought Brexit was divisive, well this was Brexit with guns, swords, murder and 10 years of violent bloodshed. And like Brexit, the divisions did not follow any class or social divides. You were as likely to have nobility fighting against the king as merchants and guildsmen fighting against parliament. This is because these wars weren't just about political ideologies. These went right to the heart of people's faith and their own personal belief about the relationship between God and the king. For centuries, people had accepted that those in power were there because they had God's blessing. But it was Charles's father, James I, who really established the notion of the divine right of kings, the God-given right of an anointed monarch to rule unhindered. He decreed that the monarch is not subject to any earthly authority, not the will of the people, not the aristocracy, not parliament. And Charles fervently believed this too. Now, divine right is all well and good when you have a strong monarch. After all, if God's going to put somebody on the throne, you also assume he'd ensure that that person had the ability to wield their power responsibly and effectively. But Charles was not a strong leader. By 1642, he was nearly bankrupt, surrounded by blatant corruption and nepotism, and struggling to keep his thinly veiled Catholic sympathies and leanings in check. These failings were glaringly obvious to both Parliament and the people of England. But what could be done? At this point in English history, Parliament had very little actual power. They were a collection of aristocrats and gentry who met as and when the King chose to offer advice and help him collect taxes. But in March 1629, Charles had had enough of Parliament limiting his plans for, and funding for extending for the High Anglican Church, which was effectively Catholic in all but name. And so he disbanded Parliament and didn't recall them for the next 11 years. By 1640, 
Charles's unpopular taxes, religious policies and attempts to extend his power in the north had resulted in a war with the Scots that ended in humiliating defeat and further anti-crown sentiment up and down the country. The resulting Treaty of Ripon left Durham and Newcastle upon Tyne under Scottish control while also paying them £850 per day for the privilege. He desperately needed financial support and legitimacy and for this he needed Parliament. Parliament was recalled but the balance of power had shifted and the parliamentarians pressed their advantage. In May 1641 Charles conceded an unprecedented act which forbade the dissolution of Parliament without Parliament's own consent. Furthermore, they abolished Charles's unpopular taxes, closed his religious courts and arrested the King's closest advisers and put them on trial. For the next year, Parliament continued to push the limits of its power, making increasingly bold demands on the King and in January 1642 it had become too much for Charles to bear. He barged into the House of Commons in an attempt to arrest and impeach five MPs, including Leicestershire MP Sir Arthur Hazelrig. But this act lost him his last remnants of support in the House. The sides became polarised and the battle lines were drawn. The people of Leicester were amongst the first to denounce the King's actions and on the 15th and 16th of February 1642, petitions were presented from the County of Leicester to both the House of Commons and the Lords. These petitions stated that We will serve Parliament with our lives as freely as they were given us, and with our estates to their utmost value. Your safety shall be our happiness, your opposers our enemies, your dangers and harms as death to us. In June, the King, now based in York, starts making plans to raise an army and his first action is to send a commission to his supporters here in Leicestershire, chief of which is the son of the Earl of Huntingdon, Henry Hastings. To these supporters, the commission states that power is given to arm, train and array all of bodily ability or sufficient means and to enlist soldiers both within and without the liberties of the county. But before the King's Commission could reach the county, a delegation of parliamentarians, including Earl of Stamford and his son, Lord Grey of Gruby, the MP for Leicester. They arrived in the town and immediately started to raise their own troops under the authority of Parliament. This action, however, becomes hindered by the arrival of a royal messenger with a proclamation denouncing the muster. And so instead, the parliamentarian forces arrange to enlist and inspect their men away from the town, meeting at Broughton Astley, Kibworth, Melton Mowbray, Quenibra and Copt Oak. Shortly afterwards, Henry Hastings' messenger arrives in Leicester with the King's Commission and commands the High Sheriff to assemble the necessary armed men at the Raw Dykes on Wednesday the 22nd of June. He also then convinces the town mayor to allow Hastings to set up a guard in the county magazine behind me. Fortunately for the parliamentarians, word reached the Earl of Stamford and he was able to remove most of the arms stored at the magazine to his home at Bradgate before Hastings could take command of the building. On the 20th of June, Parliament declared that the King's Commission in Leicester was against the law and against the liberty and property of the subject and issued a warrant for the arrest of Henry Hastings and five of his companions. On the same day, the Earl of Stamford raises a guard of 120 musketeers and 20 horse for the defence of his home at Bradgate. On the 21st of June, Hastings arrives in Loughborough from York and the following morning, with about 100 of his men, all armed with pikes and muskets, set off for Leicester. It was thought the two opposing forces of Stamford and Hastings would meet and do battle, but Stamford remained in defence of Bradgate whilst Hastings' forces marched into the town. As few of the ordered men had actually assembled at the Raw Dykes, as commanded, Hastings made his way to the Horse Fair Lees, this area just outside the former boundary of the medieval town. It was an open space that led to the south and is now remembered through the name of Horse Fair Street. By this point, the medieval town walls were all but removed, 
with only the defensive walls around the Newark still in place. Hastings set about haranguing the gathered crowd in support of Charles and publicly reads the King's Commission to raise arms. Immediately the High Sheriff, Archdale Palmer, present with his own guard of men, reads aloud the votes of Parliament that make the King's Commission illegal and then a parliamentary messenger attempts to arrest Henry Hastings. Hastings resists arrest and suddenly there is a scene of general uproar, with swords being drawn and firearms levelled on both sides. The High Sheriff and Parliamentary Commissioners became threatened by Hastings' cavaliers and managed to scramble across the remnants of the town wall to the Heron Inn, where the gates were immediately locked behind them. Hastings, who had been dismounted in the scuffle, was rescued and remounted by some of the town's royalist supporters. The unrest eventually settled down, with one account claiming that it was due to a rain shower that extinguished the matches in the muskets and other firearms. Perhaps more likely though, is that neither party wished to be the first to kill in a conflict that had, up until this point, been merely a war of words. Henry Hastings left the town later that evening, but a number of his men stayed in the town and proceeded to get heavily drunk. The following morning these men were allowed to leave the town, but not before being relieved of their weapons. For the next few weeks, Parliament and the King throw claim and counterclaim at each other regarding their respective rights to raise troops in Leicester. But it becomes clear to the King that the Parliamentarians are gaining support in the town and so on the 22nd of July, Charles arrives in Leicester in an attempt to re-establish his authority. Upon hearing of his approach, the Earl of Stamford and the other principal Parliamentarians of the county flee to Northampton. However, 25 of the Earl's men barricade themselves into the magazine in which the arms of the militia have been re returned and resolutely refuse to yield to the King's summons. Charles's throne is publicly erected in St Martin's Church behind me and from here addresses the people of the town. The address he gives is conciliatory in nature, blaming not the people of Leicester for wrongdoing but rather that they had been misinformed by persons wishing to do the country harm. But regardless, it has little effect. The response of the town council is respectful but clear. It regrets the King's estrangement from Parliament and hopes for reconciliation, but feels that this couldn't happen whilst delinquents such as Henry Hastings are protected against the justice of Parliament. They also ask for the King to recall his commission of, to array the militia and to leave the magazine in the hands of the Earl of Stamford, or, if that could not be agreed, that the whole collection of arms stored there be distributed throughout the county so as not to remain in the hands of either party. This middle ground enabled both Charles and the town authorities to conclude the talks without either losing face and so Charles and his advisers agree to the compromise with the county arms being distributed on and around the 25th of July. Over the coming weeks, the King returns to Leicester a number of times, choosing to stay here at Cavendish House, the residence of the Countess of Devon, on the former site of Leicester's Abbey. It is here that the King's nephew, the fiery Prince Rupert of the Rhine, a 23-year-old German-English soldier who had fought numerous campaigns across Europe, arrives along with his brother Prince Maurice and a number of his professional soldiers. They find the King on August 21st, 1642, and Charles promptly appoints Rupert his General of Horse and sets about making plans for the coming war. And so it was that on the afternoon of the 22nd of August, 1642, Charles and his entourage set out from Cavendish House and head north into Nottingham, and here he raises his battle flag, his standard. The English Civil War had begun. With war officially declared, both the Royalists and the Parliamentarians started to gather their forces in earnest. In time, the Royalist troops would be known as the Cavaliers and the Parliamentarians as the Roundheads, in recognition of the standardised metal helmets worn by the soldiers of the New Model Army when it formed in 1645. For now, in Leicestershire, 
the King put his forces under the command of the capable and trustworthy Colonel Henry Hastings. Hastings, the youngest son of the 5th Earl of Huntingdon, was born in Loughborough in 1610, and he was the ardent supporter of Charles I, and following the debacle with Archdale Palmer at Horsefair Lees, was made High Sheriff of Leicestershire by the King in 1642. Unsurprisingly, he immediately declared for the King at the outbreak of the war. His family home, the strategically valuable Ashby de la Zouge Castle, became his base of operations for the First Civil War. After a series of victorious battles in 1643, Charles ennobled Hastings, making him the first Baron Loughborough. Within days of the war being declared, Hastings launches his first attack, straight to the heart of his parliamentary enemies, the Earl of Stamford and Lord Grey of Gruby. Hastings, along with Prince Rupert and with a head of Royal Cavalry, leads a surprise attack on Stamford's home, Bradgate House behind me. Although the Earl and his family weren't home, the attackers assaulted the household staff, smashed his furniture and stole a considerable number of arms and ammunition. Born in 1623, Thomas, Lord Grey of Gruby, was 13 years younger than his neighbour and rival Henry Hastings. Despite his parents hosting King Charles and his wife at Bradgate when Thomas was a boy, the family increasingly struggled with the King's policies, both locally and nationally, and began to turn against Charles. In 1641, at age just 18, Thomas was elected as the Member of Parliament for Leicester and, in January 1643, aged 19 or 20, he is appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Parliamentary Forces in the Midland Counties. Although Hastings and Grey would clash numerous times over the coming months and years, it seems that Thomas was almost always responding to Henry's aggression, rather than taking the initiative himself. He also rarely ventured beyond the county lines, which could, at least in part, hark back to that initial surprise attack his family suffered at Bradgate. After the Bradgate attack, Hastings and Rupert continue south towards Leicester, spending the next few weeks raiding across the county and just beyond. Prince Rupert establishes his headquarters at Quenneborough, and from here successfully attacks Market Harbour on the 8th of September. However, the Prince's troops are then ambushed by the Earl of Stamford on their return and are forced to flee to Rockingham Castle. It was also around this time that Rupert attacked Coldcook Hall, just over the Warwickshire border, but the attack was hampered when the Leicestershire militia refused to cross the county line, even though Coldcook House was within spitting distance of the boundary. This was a common problem for both sides throughout the war. It was also from his base at Quenneborough that the somewhat impetuous Rupert sent a message to the Mayor of Leicester, demanding in the name of the King that the town send him £2,000 and that if they didn't, he would arrive at the following day with his soldiers, cavalry and cannons. The town council must have panicked. Leicester was not a rich town and a sum of £2,000 would not have easily been readily available. Strictly speaking, the town was still on the Royalist side because the corporation hadn't openly declared for Parliament by this point. So they immediately dispatched a messenger to the King in Nottingham, begging Charles for exemption from this payment. Within two days they had the King's reply, in which he made it quite clear that he had not requested any such payment from the town, that Prince Rupert had acted without his knowledge or consent and, as such, the town were not under any obligation whatsoever to meet his demands. Clearly, the opportunistic Prince Rupert needed to be kept an eye on. Unfortunately for the town, in the interim, they had felt the need to show willing to the prince and had already paid him 500 pounds. There is no record that this money was ever returned to the town. As the war progressed and towns and cities started declaring for the King or Parliament, battle lines became more and more apparent. Leicester, Nottingham, Derby, Coventry and Northampton all supported Parliament, 
but with Ashby, Loughborough, Beaver and Newark being strongly royalist, there emerged a hotly contested corridor along the Trent Valley. It is for this reason then that in these early stages of the war, much of the fighting in Leicestershire is focused in the north and northwest of the county. In 1643, these include skirmishes and small battles at the King's Mills garrison behind me at Donington, Sproxton Heath, Melton Mowbray and Bagworth Heath, the latter being where Hastings lost an eye from a pistol shot. In 1644, although there were skirmishes at Breeding on the Hill and the Vale of Beaver, the fighting also spreads further south, with encounters at Hinckley, Bosworth and Belgrave Bridge. However, the largest battles in the county happened here at Coates Bridge, just to the east of Loughborough. Desperate to prevent Prince Rupert and his troops relieving a parliamentarian siege of the town of Newark, on the 15th of March, Sir Edward Hartop and the Nottinghamshire Horse Regiment headed south towards Loughborough. Meanwhile, hoping to distract Lord Grey and the Leicester garrison, Hastings and the Governor of Beaver, Sir Gervais Lucas, had a half-hearted attack on Leicester before retiring to Mount Sorrel, followed at some distance by Lord Grey and the Leicester troops. The following day, the 16th of March, the Royalist army is surprised by the arrival of Hartop's troops on their way to intercept Prince Rupert. But Hartop only sends one regiment to attack the Royalists, failing to, pre to press home his advantage and cut Hastings and Lucas off from their base at Ashby. Instead, they are able to withdraw to the chain of bridges here that span the six channels of the River Saw at the time. Although Hartop gave chase, the notoriously uncooperative Lord Grey didn't support him with the Leicester garrison for a further two days, by which point the Royalists had fortified their position on the Coates Bridge. Once Grey had arrived, the Nottinghamshire troop attacked from the north of the river, whilst Lord Grey fired his two cannons at the defenders. In the battle, the Royalist horse were defeated and were physically chased through the streets of Loughborough to Burley Hall, which stood on part of the Loughborough University campus. Meanwhile, the Royalist foot soldiers were driven off the bridge and into the neighbouring meadow, where they stood until night fell. Again, Hartop failed to press his advantage and, upon hearing of Prince Rupert's arrival at Ashby, withdraws his troops from Coates Bridge, leaving Lord Grey unsupported who then retires back to Leicester. This lack of organisation between neighbouring garrisons was to prove costly as Hastings was able to leave Coates with his troops relatively undamaged and then add 2,700 men to Rupert's 6,420 men which was then able to successfully relieve the siege of Newark and dealing the parliamentarians their most complete defeat of the entire war. Hartop's actions, or lack thereof, were to become the subject of both a county committee inquiry and a parliamentary investigation. However, tempers became so enraged between the rival Leicester and Nottingham sides that it resulted in personal threats and physical violence. The inquiries were eventually dropped in order to re-establish unity amongst the local parliamentarians. But the horrors of the English Civil War weren't limited purely to the battlefield. There are numerous reports across the country of apparently innocent people going about their business, finding themselves suddenly at the mercy of either the Royalists or the Parliamentarian soldiers. And Leicester was no different. On Wednesday the 14th of August 1644, a group of Royalist cavalrymen from Ashby were looking to attack a convoy of gunpowder which was due to pass through the village of Belgrave. They crossed the bridge here at Thurkeston Road and travelled into the village and they stopped and questioned a local about its whereabouts. But when the local was unable to tell them where it was, the soldiers then shot and hacked him to death. One report claims that he was killed because he supposedly looked like a parliamentarian. Such was the division and violence created by the Civil War.
After two and a half years of brutal fighting up and down the country, the civil war was becoming a war of attrition. Despite battles being won by both sides, as yet there had been no decisive victories, although by 1644 the parliamentarians were gaining the upper hand in the conflict. However, all this was to change in the summer of 1645 when Leicester would become not only the focus of the war in the county, but the focus of the civil war entirely. As early as July 1644, a parliamentarian newspaper was to proclaim that Leicester was in very grave danger, and in a report to Lord Grey, who had relinquished his command in order to, in order to remain the MP for Leicester, Colonel George Booth stated that the defences and the garrison were in a weak and undisciplined state, and that the town could be easily taken by as little as 500 well-managed soldiers. He also expressed a fear that any plans to fortify the Newark, the only part of the town which still maintained its medieval defensive wall, would alienate the rest of the town. So later that month, Parliament commands the Leicester Corporation officials to immediately improve the fortifications, but also specifically orders them not to fortify the Newark, much to the dismay of the town council. Work then begins in earnest on improving the town's defences, with a series of huge defensive ditches and earth walls created surrounding the town in a formation similar to that of those around the town of Newark at the time. Although recent excavations have shown us the locations of some of these defensive ditches, the evidence for most have been erased over time, leaving James Hollings's plan of perhaps the most accurate illustration, although even this was drawn 200 years after the fact in 1840. On the 7th of May 1645, Charles leaves his capital of Oxford and marches north to relieve the parliamentarian siege of Chester, before then carrying on to reconquer the north of England. But on the 20th of May, at Market Drayton in North Shropshire, the King receives word that the parliamentarians have abandoned the Chester siege, and so the Royalist army turns east towards their stronghold at Newark. However, two days later, Sir Thomas Fairfax, the parliamentarian commander-in-chief, lays siege to Charles's beloved Oxford with his new model army, which throws the King's plans into disarray. The New Model Army was founded in 1645 by Fairfax as an alternative to the traditional use of regional part-time militia for fighting wars. Instead, this new parliamentary army consisted of full-time trained professionals who were willing and able to serve anywhere in the country, including Scotland and Ireland, as required. On the 26th of May, word reaches the King that Oxford has been besieged and realising that it would take too long to march his army back to Oxford to face Fairfax, the King and Prince Rupert decide to attack Leicester, hoping that this will lure the new model army away from his capital. The following day, Charles rendezvous with the rest of the Royalist army in Ashby de la Zouche and on the 28th, the Royalist forces travel to Loughborough, where they meet with Hastings' troops and an additional 1,200 cavalry from Newark, swelling the King's ranks to well over 10,000 men. Realising the danger they are facing, the Leicester Town Committee has already sent messengers to Nottingham, Coventry, Derby and Northampton, as well as to commanders of the New Model Army to appeal for help. However, by the 28th, when the town is closed off by the brilliantly named Royalist Sir Marmaduke Langdale, with his 1,500 horsemen, the only people to answer the call are Captain Hacker with his 100 horse from Kirby Bellas and Major Innes who brings 200 dragoons from Humberston. In total, the garrison charged with defending the whole town against the massive Royalist army is numbered just 2,070 people. What's more, over 50% of these defenders are civilian townsmen or countrymen aged anywhere between 16 and 60. By the end of the 29th of May, 1645, the stage is set for the bloodiest 48 hours in Leicester's over 2,000 year history. The repercussions of which will not only shape the town for decades to come, but will impact on the outcome of the entire civil war. To find out what happened next, join me for Hidden Histories and Uncivil War Part 2. Thanks for watching.